Now for today's program. Sarah Hurwitz served as a White House speechwriter from 2009 to 2017, first as a senior speechwriter for President Barack Obama, and then as head speechwriter for First Lady Michelle Obama. Sarah was also the chief speechwriter for Hillary Clinton during the 2008 presidential campaign. Sarah has been profiled, interviewed, and published in many publications and news outlets, including The Washington Post, The Today Show, Morning Joe, and The Wall Street Journal, among many others and the forward named her one of 50 Jews who impacted American life in 2016 and 2019. In spring 2017, Sarah was a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard University, her alma mater. Sarah is the author of Here All Along, Finding Meaning, Spirituality, and a Deeper Connection in Life in Judaism, after finally choosing to look there, a book about her experience rediscovering Judaism as an adult. Here All Along was a finalist for two National Jewish Book Awards and for the Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature. Amy E. Schwartz is Moment Magazine's book and opinion editor, as well as editor of the magazine's popular Ask the Rabbi section. She recently won first place in commentary from the Religion News Association. Before coming to Moment, Amy was a longtime editorial writer and op-ed columnist at the Washington Post, where she was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in commentary. Amy is president of the Non-Denominational Jewish Studies Center in Washington, D.C., and is the editor of the book, Can Robots Be Jewish? and Other Pressing Questions of Modern Life. Please welcome Sarah Horowitz and Amy E. Schwartz. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming on um, on this very hot day, at least here in Washington. Sarah, thank you so much for agreeing to talk with us about Jewish life and Jewish identity. Big topic. Oh, it is. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. So let's start at the beginning. Um, Sarah, you became a significant voice in the Jewish community um, after you published this wonderful book that Suzanne described in 2019 called Here All Along about finding the riches of Judaism as an adult, a very successful adult, I might add. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the journey, the Jewish journey that led up to the book? And then after that, we'll talk about the journey the book has taken you on from then till now. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, I grew up maybe like some of the people who are on this webinar today where, you know, it was a pretty half-hearted Jewish family. I think Judaism for my family was two very boring high holiday services, you know, a pretty uninspired Seder, a Hanukkah party to make us feel better about not having Christmas, which was fun, and Hebrew school, also boring. And, you know, to me, that was the Judaism, right? Judaism was four holidays and Hebrew school. That's it. Nothing else. That's that's the Judaism. And by the time I became a bat mitzvah, I thought, well, I think I've, I think I've seen everything there is to see here. I'm, I'm done. Thank you. I'm going to move on with my life and leave this behind. And I did, largely. You know, I was still a cultural Jew. I was still vaguely proud to be Jewish. But I, I knew if I wanted meaning, I'd have to really look elsewhere. And then fast forward 25 years into the future, I'm 36 years old. I broke up with a guy I was dating. I was very lonely and anxious and had a lot of time on my hands. And I happened to hear about an intro to Judaism class from the DC JCC, Jewish Community Center. And I signed up just to fill time. No special, you know, I wasn't on some big journey. I thought I should probably learn about my culture. But, you know, what I discovered in that class just absolutely blew me away. You know, this is thousands of years of wisdom on the human condition and what it means to be a good person and lead a worthy life and find profound spiritual connection. And I really was just, I couldn't believe it. I kept thinking, where has this been all my life? Like, it almost seemed like this had been somehow hidden from me my entire life. I had seen none of this in those high holiday services or that Seder or Hanukkah party or Hebrew school. Again, because I was, you know, nine, understandably. And I just thought I need to learn more. So I started reading hundreds of books. I studied with rabbis and I took classes. And I just thought, you know, I want to share this with people. And, you know, there are a lot of great intro books out there that'll teach you the nuts and bolts. There are great academic books out there that... You need a lot of time and patience to plow through, which I had, but most people don't. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. And I just thought, you know, where's the book for people like me who, yes, want to know the basics, but more importantly, want to unearth the deepest, most profound, transformational, radical, revolutionary, brilliant wisdom this tradition offers. I and that's probably, really the book that yeah. I tried to write. I should probably interject here that you were coming off of this uh, period of writing speeches for um, the Obamas. So yeah. um, did that play a part in sort of this this desire to go high and lofty and, you know, look at, <laughs> big, look, look at big, big things? You know, 
I, I'm not sure I would say that. I mean, it's certainly, I, I will say, I think I learned so much about writing from Mrs. Obama. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I heard her voice in my head when I was writing this book saying, you know, okay, Sarah, that's a sloppy transition or okay, you're, you're, getting, you're getting in the weeds. You're missing the beating heart. What's the beating heart? What's really deeply true here? You know, that is, those were the questions she was always asking herself and asking me. And so I always kind of had that voice in my head. It's like, wait, is this moving? Is this powerful? Are you really getting at the heart of this? Or are you kind of stuck in the, the edges and the details? And that was a, a constant theme as I, as I wrote. Mm-hmm. So, so that, so then, so not everyone who rediscovers Judaism as an adult, I think, has the the wherewithal gets 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 uh, <laughs> is ambitious enough to go ahead and and put that journey into a book, which I think is why this book was so, you, as you said, you wrote it, you wrote a book that you wanted wanted to find out there. So, um, what happened after that with you and Judaism? Like, I'm thinking, you know, you write a book about Judaism, you go on a whole different kind of a Jewish journey. Like, how did wow. that change you? You know, something that was so meaningful and moving to me was that when you write a book, you then have the gift of getting to sell the book. So I got to travel around to all different kinds of Jewish communities, meet with all different people. And I really, you know, I expected that people like me who had been disengaged, you know, would read my book and say, oh, this spoke to me. And they did. I got that a lot. It's like, oh, I grew up just like you. This book is for me. And I say, yes, nailed it. But what kind of struck me is I kept meeting very traditionally observant Jews. You know, very, very like Orthodox Jews, you know, ultra Orthodox, Chabad, whatever, who would say, actually, this book is for me. And I thought like, nope, definitely you're not my target audience. But they would say, no, you don't get it. This book is for me. Like, I don't necessarily agree with the way you practice. I don't necessarily, you know, agree with everything you say, but there was a lot of fresh thinking. You actually made me fall in love with this tradition again. And I see that you did your homework. You know, I saw the hundreds of end notes. I see your passion for this tradition. And it was a realization for me that our texts, you know, our sacred texts, which might mean the heart of our book is me looking at sacred texts and trying to unearth their wisdom. You know, this is something that connects us all across the Mm -hmm. Jewish world. You know, for all the talks about all these divisions that we have, you know, when I studied with an ultra Orthodox rabbi and he identifies himself that way, that is how he identifies. Yeah, we disagreed on a lot of things. We have a different kind of practice, but we are both just taking joy in this text, you know, getting, having a real conversation about this text. And I I think that is something that can unite us, unite us all as Jews and something that should you know, I think about um, Amos Oz and his daughter, Fania Oz Salzberger, wrote a beautiful book I'm sure you're familiar with called Jews Fania and Words. writes columns for us, yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. This book is wonderful gorgeous. Book. Yeah. And they say something to the effect of, you know, Judaism is not a bloodline, it's a text line. Mm-hmm. And I just think more wonderful. than anything, right, that's what this is. This is a text line. And so I think, you know, getting to meet all these people who shared my passion for engaging with this text line, um, that was pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. So I know that after this, we're going to get sort of, um, we're going to look at some some negative things, but that to me, does that give, I mean, that to me is a, a way to look for hope for the Jewish community to say in some ways, this community is kind of healthy in some ways, right? Is that? Yeah. I mean, I think, I or I think it, it can be healthy, right? I think, mm-hmm. you know, I think we've, I think in, you know, for many, many reasons, I think that there's sometimes this impulse in the Jewish community to say, no, 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 you don't need to know things. That's silly. Just take the Judaism into your heart and feel it and it'll be great. And that's (laughs) not true, right? That's disrespectful to our tradition. This isn't an easy tradition. This isn't a tradition you pitch from a street corner or put on a bumper sticker, right? This is a deep, vast, rich tradition with millions and millions and millions of pages of text. And I think that the more you engage with those texts, the more deeply and richly you can participate in this tradition. So I actually think, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that we're we're doing it now as a Jewish community, I think, but I think that it actually provides me with a tremendous amount of hope because despite all of our divisions, our texts are our shared home, right? They are where we can come around and have a discussion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's beautifully put, of course. Um, and it's... It's it's interesting because one of the ways people sometimes describe the kind of Judaism you're saying you were brought up with is, I, I, you've probably heard this term, pediatric Judaism. Yeah. In other words, it's just, it models kids doing Judaism, but it doesn't model adults doing Judaism. Yes. So. Um, totally. A hundred percent right. And that makes sense because we stop learning when we become a B'nai Mitzvah, right? We, we stop learning at 12, 13, which is just when you are old enough to start learning, right? Mm-hmm. So we all, all kind right. of, and then we grow up with our 12 year old Judaism. And then we have kids and think, "Uh Oh, somebody has got to make this kid Jewish. Not me. I don't know anything. I'll just voice this kid on some poor Hebrew school teacher and rabbi and say, you have to make the kid Jewish, which 
by the way, spoiler alert, no Hebrew school teacher or rabbi is going to make your kid Jewish in two hours a week. The truth is we all have to grow up. We have to become adult Jews. You know, writing my book was me trying to help people go on that journey, which I had to go on. I had to grow up and man, it was rough. I spent thousands of hours reading and learning and studying and no one has time to do that. So I was hoping with this book to condense what I found into something that you could read in eight hours, right? That's a little bit more reasonable and that could set you on a path to inspire you to do maybe another eight hours, another 10 hours and to keep on going. So you want to get people to the on-ramp, you know, it's not exactly. the end of the story. So. No, 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 no. I want it to be a beginning. And look, to engage deeply with this tradition, you first need a wide web of context. You need to actually have a net in which you can catch all the more complex things. You kind of need to know, like, what are the texts? What's the Torah, Talmud, later commentaries? What are the holidays? What's the cycle of the year? You need to know the basics. And then once you have that web of context, then you can start catching the deeper things. So I was hoping that my book would give people both that web and a bunch of the deeper things so they could get a taste and would inspire them to keep going. So I was going to come back to this later, but I, this seems like such an obvious segue. I have to ask, yeah. um, if you were redesigning Jewish education for kids in this country, what would it look like? Oh my gosh. I mean, I am not, I feel a lot of humility in getting quite this question because I'm not a parent and I'm not an educator. So I just, I just, I first, my first thing to say is like, this is actually not the job of educators entirely to teach kids Judaism, right? This is a tradition that more than anything, parents really need to be teaching kids at the home. And that's so hard when you're someone who grew up without much of it or without any of it. That's very hard, which again is why I wrote this book to say like, okay, I know this is hard. I'm hoping to make it a little easier for you. But, you know, so I actually, I don't know. It's a great, the, the child, I have many thoughts on adult education, almost none on childhood education because I just have no expertise. It's, it's, yeah, it's a very, it's definitely a conundrum. Everyone's, um, you know, would you send your kids to day school, you know, or? I mean, I, if I had kids, I would send them to day school. I think that that background, learning Hebrew, getting the history, I think when you do that early on, you know, the kid, kids can do what they want with that, but you can never take that away, right? Like you, once you have that Hebrew, even if you lose it, you can get it back. Once you have that background, even if you go in a totally different direction, it's always there. And I, that's something I actually now wish I had had. Um, I'm now trying to learn Hebrew, and it is it's a lot more challenging than it would have been had I had many years of Hebrew in day school. Right. But so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let us, um, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm no, just, no, it's, it's fine. I get, that, I get asked that question a lot, and I just, I, I don't, I try not to opine on things where I really don't know what I'm talking about, and that would be a good example. Well, I think if the community knew how to fix this, they would, you know. Exactly. It's not like right. anyone thought questions. of it, but uh, it's yeah. a very difficult question. I, I did have one other question about um, sort of gateways. Um, people sometimes make the same observation about why don't Jews go to synagogue more is because people, especially people who are highly um, competent in their lives, they don't want to start at square one and go into a synagogue and have no idea what's going on and have to start, you know, like that. So is that something you see people using your book for too? I know that's not I really- I do. Emphasis. Yeah, I do. And I wouldn't, I would not recommend a synagogue as your first stop in a, in a Jewish journey. <laughs> that's not, I wouldn't stop you, but I don't, I don't think that's it. I also just would argue that that, that idea that everything happens in the sanctuary of a synagogue, that all the important stuff happens there. That's a very almost like Protestant idea of Judaism. That is, I, that, that's not actually true. I, I would argue that the most important form of Jewish worship actually is Jewish study. Um, I would, I, you know, our rabbis say the most important mitzvah is Jewish study. So I just, you know, I think we've kind of have a little bit of a warped way of practicing Judaism that's sort of emerged from being in Christian countries. So I, I, you know, I know there's a lot of emphasis on like, okay, that's the first step, but I don't, I think if you know nothing, um, it might be a fun experience. There's nothing wrong with it, but I'm, I'm not sure that's really going to get you on the right foot for your journey. Well, I'm sure you find a lot of study. It's a dyad, right? A lot of study is about practice. Jewish studies yeah. not taking place in a, it. In in, a... It, it inspires practice, right? It informs practice. It makes practice real and deep. And by the well, way, I... I do I do believe in going to a synagogue to meet with a rabbi, to take a class, to become to be part of a, an activity or a ritual. I'm just saying there's an idea that you need to go to a service and that's where you learn Judaism. And I, I don't think uh, a synagogue service is necessarily a place where I would start learning Judaism. I think that's a place you get to, but I, I don't know if I would necessarily start there. Others might. Totally depends on your sensibility. 
So where do you look for Jewish community? I'm not saying it has to be from a synagogue, but that's the obvious next question. I mean, I think a synagogue is a great place to find Jewish community. I think that's actually a great first stop, right? That that's a ready-made community. It has all kinds of diverse options that you could enter there. So I, mm-hmm. I don't like it when people trash synagogues. I find that very unhelpful and, and just not true. There are lots of amazing, thriving synagogues. So I, I highly recommend that. But again, I also understand that for some people that really doesn't work. So there are so many other, you know, there are Jewish service organizations for young people, if that's your passion. There are Jewish environmental groups. There are Jewish, you know, feminist mikvah groups. There are spirituality and meditation groups. There are lots of different kinds of Jewish communities. And it's not one or the other. You can actually join them all, right? You can do whichever <laughs> ones appeal to you. So I, I say the more the merrier, you know, find one that fits or many that fit. Age of Zoom, you can do them all simultaneously. Right? Why not? <laughs> right. So that leads us to what you've been doing lately, which is you've been able to take the temperature of the Jewish community or Jewish communities all over America. <laughs> you're traveling and you're on college campuses. I tell us been. about <laughs> tell us about first just tell us what you what it's like to be in Jewish community nowadays on college mm-hmm. campuses. Yeah, um, you know, uh I would say terrifying if I'm being honest. You know, I I I think that um, it's actually much worse than I thought it was. And I actually did thought it was pretty bad already. But I'll you know, I'll say, I think what struck me, and I, I started going right after October 7th, and I traveled through May. I went to 20 different college campuses where I spoke on College Hillels. And I think what just struck me is the kind of extremism that has taken hold on college campuses when it comes to Israel. You know, on a lot of campuses, Israel has been put in the same bucket as the KKK and the Nazi party. And there's no contact you can have with those entities that's okay. I can't say, well, I'm I'm a Nazi, but I'm a liberal Nazi. Don't don't worry. Or, you know, I'm in the KKK, but I do believe in minority rights. No, right? These are groups that need to be done away with. There's nothing there's nothing okay or acceptable about them. And you know, in a lot of places, Israel has now been put in that bucket. So any connection you have with it is problematic. And what I saw as a result is, you know, you see these encampments and they're loud and they're scary and they're bad. But I almost think that that's not the worst thing on campus. What I saw that really chilled me was this pervasive, systemic ostracization and humiliation of Jewish students who were, you know, crazy enough to admit that maybe they didn't want to disavow Israel, right? Students who just refused to disavow Israel. You know, I saw a lot of campuses, like all of the student clubs are aligned with Students for Justice in Palestine, which is a national campus organization that organized celebrations of, of the October 7th massacres. I mean, they were you know, celebrating this as resistance and this is exciting and this is great, which is a very extreme view, right? This is not a moderate, thoughtful view. This is pretty extreme to see clubs align with them and not just, you know, a club that seems directly tied with Israel or Palestine, but you know, like the gardening club and the beekeeping club and just totally random clubs issuing statements, which I found a little chilling. So I saw groups, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. On one campus, they told me the gar- gardening and beekeeping club had officially so allied us- with SJP. Why? I don't know. Right. I also saw, you know, seeing a lot of clubs refusing to co-sponsor events with Hillel because Hillel is a Zionist entity. You know, I saw like the kind of no Zionist allowed policy that a lot of clubs have, whether they say it formally or informally, especially like progressive clubs, the queer club, like they will just, you know, they will post things on social media that are so, they're not arguments. They're not things like, okay, we're against the war because of X or the occupation is bad because of Y. It's like, the genocidal, racist, apartheid, colonial state is being depraved. And it's like, whoa, okay, these are not arguments. And a lot of Jewish students told me, you know, we've tried to have a dialogue. We've tried to reach out and said, let's just talk. It can be over coffee. And what they're told is, no, that would be normalizing you as a Zionist. And I won't do that. So do you think a lot of this is signaling what the kids are putting on social media if they don't understand? I mean, what what you'd call just they're just, you know, what they would call. Yeah, I mean, it can. Sure, it is. But I mean, it's still really damaging and scary, right? If you're if you can if you're now kicked out of your progressive club that you wanted to be part of, if your roommates are posting pretty terrifying things on social media, even if they're just signaling, it, it still creates a pretty ugly atmosphere. And it's and I don't, actually don't think it's just signaling because a lot of students told me like they have friends who won't talk to them anymore. You know, like I and you see it also with a lot of authority figures. You know, I had a student who told me that her RA in her dorm who, you know, identified as a very strong anti-Zionist, would neither look at her nor speak to her. This girl's a freshman. She's just a Jew. She was not some big Israel activist, but her RA would neither look at her or speak to her, which I think was a little disconcerting. Or, you know, the teacher who 
professor who announced that all Jews have the blood of all Palestinians on her hands in class one day, or the teacher who, you know, in a graphic design class every week would be saying these pretty strident things about Israel, which again, look, free country. It just seems like maybe a graphic design class every week is probably not where that should be the focus. I don't know, that just, just thought that I have. Or a friend, you know, one student whose TA told her that he thought Hamas should be running America. Which again, you know, if a white TA said to a black student, I think the KKK should run America, I, I'm pretty confident we would all be pretty clear on what needs to happen. And, you know, nothing. And, you know, oftentimes what I think really bothered me is a lot of these Jewish students, like, I would say, well, did you report that? Oh, my God, I would I'd be very upset. And they're like, nah. And I was like, OK, oh. that's horrible. And they'd say, well, it's kind of it's just normal. I don't know. This stuff just happens. Like they didn't they didn't see it because I, I'm in college in the 90s where inconceivable and to them i think this has happened more and more to the point that it's become normal and i saw that in myself you know the first five or six visits i was sputtering i was angry i couldn't believe it and then you know visit 19 when there, a kid is telling me he got death threats i'm like okay that happens so wait so tell us i mean these are we've all seen this horrible parade of terrible mm -hmm. stories if we ever look at you know social media if we ever look at mothers against campus anti-semitism we've we've heard these stories i take a step yes. back and give us a little bit more of a narrative about you like you started going to these campuses what campuses yes. did you go to where would you speak how did you start encountering this experience. Yeah. I give mean, us, I went to some, you know. I went to a variety of campuses. It was campuses across the country. So it okay. was big state schools. It was small private schools. It was East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. I mean, it was really a very diverse assortment of schools. There wasn't one particular kind. And I would generally speak in the Hillel. Um, so the students. So where were, were you? Yeah. So like, where were you right after October seventh? Where were you speaking? So I, I had my first school. I spoke at University of Wisconsin Madison and Northwestern. Mm -hmm. Northwestern has had a lot, a lot of pretty bad stuff beforehand. And I think this was the time where I think, you know, it was like, okay, the, the Jews are dead. There is a kind of, you know, there's a little bit of sympathy and, and we haven't started actually doing anything about being dead. And that's, I think, our sweet spot where people actually still like us. So I just, you know, talking to these students, I think, you know, a few of them were savvy enough to know that things were about to get bad. But I think a lot of the other ones were like, okay, it's not great, but I think it'll get better. Um, so that's kind of what I was seeing. I think what I, you know, as I tried to understand this stuff, I mean, you're right, you can just, you know, you can look up, if you want to learn the horror stories, you can look online, but I think it's actually important to really understand this stuff because a lot of people don't, you know, what I actually got, you know, there is still, there are still people who are like, oh, it's not that bad. It's not anti-Semitism, whatever. And it's like, okay, that's interesting. I'm like, if I, there are lots of college campuses where if I walked across the campus wearing a t-shirt saying I'm a Zionist, I would be, you know, mocked, heckled, harassed, whatever. Okay. You know, they're like, well, that's not anti-Semitism. I'm like, okay, what if a black student walked ac across campus that was majority white with the Black Lives Matter t-shirt and people heckled, mocked, harassed him? What would you call that? Well, they're like, well, I mean, I guess that's sort of racist. It's like, okay, interesting. What if a gay student walked across campus with a, a, gay, fried a gay pride flag t-shirt and got heckled, mocked, whatever? What would you call that? They're like, well okay, maybe that's homophobia, but wait a second. No, no, no. It's about Israel. It's about Israel. That's the problem. And it's like, okay, what if a Chinese American student walks across campus with a t-shirt that says, I love China? And what if her classmates actually know in de great detail about the human rights violations in China? Are they really going to heckle her and abuse her? Or are they going to look at her and think she probably does not support the Chinese government's human rights violations, but maybe she has family there. Maybe she is proud of her culture, her heritage. Like, I think they might possibly was, be able to discern they there might. was actually a lot of stuff like that during covid i mean maybe more on the right where Exa there was Asian absolutely Americans and chinese were told were associated with you know wuhan flu or whatever so there it's was not, you know, and that was on the right that was not on college campuses that was not among right. the respectable yeah. people so yeah oh look if you're asking me do 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 like do nazis hate you yeah, they do, do yeah. racist hate, hate, hate they do does, i, I does agree but happen. we're yeah. talking about the left this is the problem. And I think that, you know, this is confusing because we have been trained to think of anti-Semitism as Holocaust anti-Semitism. That's how we learn about anti-Semitism. Holocaust anti-Semitism anti is the Holocaust. It's Jews are bad. Nothing they can do to be okay. We must kill them. That's anti-Semitism. And that's like, that's not happening on campus. But actually what's happening on campus is something a little different. This is the author, Dara Horn, talks about this a lot. It's not so much an eliminationist kind of anti-Semitism, but a conversionist, a conversionist kind of anti-Semitism where it's like, okay, Jews are bad, but actually there is something they can do to be okay. 
And that something is that they can reject whatever it is about Jewish civilization that we, the majority, think is disgusting. So back in the day, it was Jewish religion that was disgusting. And if you know, in medieval times you converged to Christianity, then you were saved. You were an acceptable Christian. You were fine. Except not really, you know. Except but, not really, right? Yeah. Except that's 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 the problem with this, right? You were okay, maybe for a while, maybe. possibly. Yeah. You know, but I mean, and then you know, my grandparents' parents' generation, it was like, mm, you're too Jewy. Just dis- get rid of your last name, your nose, your accent. Just just be less Jewy, and then you'll be okay, maybe. Mm-hmm. And today it's just disavow your ancestral homeland and then you're safe and acceptable and saved. And this is a conversion narrative that you sometimes see, right? Like growing up, I, my rabbi told me Israel was amazing and and perfect and wonderful. And then though I got to campus and they told me that they're committing genocide and colonialism and apartheid. And I saw the light, I had an epiphany and I took anti-racism, anti-colonialism into my heart and I became an anti-Zionist and now I'm saved. Now I've converted to anti-Zionist. Have you seen Israelism, the movie? That it's so funny that you say you're that. Describing? I was no, it actually isn't. It's this is something I, I saw on campus. Then I read, I haven't seen the movie, but I read Yehuda Kurtzer's excellent review of it. And I thought, yes, this is what I've been talking about on campus. He perfectly said it. And look, are students saying this exact narrative? No, but this is kind of what you see. And you know, I think that this actually gets at we have to be really thoughtful about Israel education. We cannot just give students and young people total propaganda and Israel's perfect and it's magical. No, Israel's the country. And guess what? It was founded like so many other countries in the 1930s and 40s. Like Israel is actually very typical in many ways in its founding story. It's typical in many of the things it's done. You know, I think we need to normalize Israel rather than exceptionalizing Israel and say mm-hmm. like Israel is great. It's, it is a miracle. It is wonderful. I, I'm a huge Zionist. I feel such pride and love for this country. And I never lose sight of the fact that it's a country. And I think we can do both. I think we can tell them the good and the bad and convey our love and make them fall in love so that when they get to college, they're not surprised to find that, hey, it's a country. You know, so I think that's just really, really important. And I think also students are a little confused because we think of anti-Semitism as a kind of social anti-Semitism of you're a Jew, you're yucky, you can't be in my club, whatever. Um, but there are there is a kind of more political anti-Semitism that says that the Jew is really the symbol of whatever it is that society finds most most loathsome. So in Christendom, the Jews were the Christ killers. In you know Nazi Germany, they were the race polluters. Today, where colonialism and racism are the biggest sins, oh, amazing Jews are the colon- colonialists and the racists. And you know the problem is that that kind of political anti-Semitism it can turn into that social anti-Semitism that conversionist anti-Semitism it can come it can turn into that eliminist and eliminationist anti-Semitism where okay I've converted to being an anti-Zionist but it's not quite enough and you do I do see on some campuses where like they're they're not bothering to do the it's the Jews not the it's the Zionists not the Jews anymore I, I am seeing some of the the Jews stuff and that's like well tell they'll tell us again like I want to tell tell yeah. us some. Tell us some stories. Tell us, for instance, yeah. I'd be curious to hear how, if you're speaking at a Hillel, you encountered these conversion narratives. That's a very good way of putting it. But I, I'm trying to envision. I just, I just, we want to. I, I think I'd like to hear more about. You know, you go there, you you speak to these kids, and they say something back. Like, paint us a picture. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty much it. Like, there's not. I mean, I would often talk to them you, beforehand. So yeah. we would, I would have a discussion. I just say like, tell me about your experience on campus. Good, bad, ugly. Just give me the honest thing. And it often kind of wound up being this very kind of horrible, this, this kind of horrible show and tell, you know, where it would be mm-hmm. like, okay, you know, I was walking into my dorm and this, this guy screamed fucking Jew at me. Like, well, that's not great. Or the girl who said that freshman year, her roommate kept insisting on putting swastikas all over her room. And she kept telling the roommate, that's offensive to me. Here's why, here's the history. And she, she reported it and it took the administration three weeks to separate them. And I would just ask you, you know, if a black student had a white roommate who was putting nooses around the room, I would hope the separation would take place more in like three minutes, you know, not, but, not three yeah. weeks. If I'm not mistaken, wasn't Michelle Obama, one of the things in her book is that she had a roommate who insisted on being removed from having a black roommate and she didn't even realize. Oh, God, I had totally that. forgotten about I, I You're right. She did. Yeah. I had forgotten Prince, about that. Princeton I mean, in the 90s, I guess. In the yeah. 80s. Yeah. 80s, I mean, so. so it's, you know, it's me hearing a lot of just stories like mm-hmm. that. Like I would just sit and I would just listen. And, you know, a lot of them also had really positive things to say about their Hillels and about their Jewish community and about, you know, friends or professors who had supported them. You know, mm-hmm. so they were definitely, they were learning. And I will say, you know, 
it's not all, like what they're taking away from this. It's not just defeat and despair. Hillel is really helping these kids endure. And I think I, something that confused me at first is that, you know, I really expected these Jewish kids would be like other students in their generation. And it would be a lot of dogma and slogans and canceling. I just, you know, this is the kids today. But what I found was that they were very careful. There was a real like nuance and precision, which I almost found a little jarring where a kid would say, okay, here's my opinion, but I also want to recognize these arguments against it. And I, I hear them and I'm wrestling with, and I was like, strange. And I realized that, you know, Jewish students, because they're so often told, like, stop with your white Jewish tears. Your voice mm. doesn't matter. Stop. You know, everything you're saying is wrong. They kind of learn not to open their mouths unless they know what they're saying. They learn to question themselves in advance and challenge themselves and really to draw on facts, not just feelings. And I, you know, it breaks my heart that that's the, there's a bad reason why they're doing that. But that's actually a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. They are learning to wrestle, to challenge themselves, to really think deeply. And they spend a lot of time because everyone tells them to shut up. They spend a lot of time listening to other people's stories and arguments, which is a good thing. They are aware of what people, how people think differently than they do, different narratives. And I think that is helping them be more thoughtful and nuanced. And so I think it's not okay. It certainly is not. I'm not saying this is a silver lining. No, zero about this is okay. But what's pretty amazing is how these students are responding with this maturity, which, with this thoughtfulness, with this nuance, and by arguing, right? By learning to argue and debate and really deeply Jewish, actually, the response I saw on campus. And that was heartening to me. Well, that's sometimes you, I mean, anti-Semitism makes Jews more Jewish, right? I mean, that's makes the communities. Absolutely. I mean, are you, are, what's your, what's your, if you take the temperature of Jewish communities, you know, yeah. what do you, what do you see? So, I mean, I definitely see a lot of fear. I see mm -hmm. a lot of panic. And I do think, you know, I am very, I'm definitely pretty amped up about this. I'm pretty upset. I also see a mistake, which is people picking on really small things and, and freaking out about them. I we need to pick our that. battles. We need, I mean, like, like you know, instance. picking up on, I'm trying to think of a good example, just some small minor thing that someone may or may not have even meant to, they may or not, may not have even meant harm. And it's sort of like, no, we have to just, any little thing that pops up, we got to smash down with a hammer. I disagree. There are so many big, horrible, bad things happening. And we got to keep our eye on those balls. And really, because that's the stuff that is just clearly observably bad. And if we keep directing people to that and saying, look at this observably bad thing, we got to fight this. We are much more credible than if we're saying this small thing and this small thing and this small thing, like then it's not credible, right? Then it's not credible. We need to be really thoughtful about the argument we're making because I think we're getting distracted sometimes by minor things when there are major, serious, scary things staring us in the face. So I'd like us to really be thoughtful about focusing our energy and about, you know, how do we respond? Are, are we going to try to censor and shut down free speech? I don't think that's a great idea. I think that any, we have to remember anything we do, they can do to us. You know, mm -hmm. responding to students by doxing them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, if they did that to our kids, that would be devastating. That's not helpful. And I will tell you, many of the hills I went to were really struggling with outsiders coming in and doing these heavy handed tactics that the hills themselves were saying, please don't do that. Our students don't want that. It's not helpful. And so I really you know, I think it's so important for us to actually listen to the leaders and the staff and the students on campus and give them the help they're asking for, not the help that we wish to impose on them. And what do they want? What is the help? What can we do to help these? Yeah, students? I mean, I think a lot of what you can do is support them. Donate to Hillel. Like, you know, there, uh, it's, it's not just Hillel, it's, right? There are lots of It's not just Hillel. Other, I mean, that's what I'm groups. familiar with, but yeah. donate to campus organizations. Uh -huh. And frankly, ask them. I actually don't know. I think every Hillel would say that they have different needs. Maybe they want, you know, books donated for study, or maybe they want to fund a speaker coming in or a rabbi to tutor their kids. You know, I, they might, or they maybe they want to take an Israel trip or a really cool thing where they travel to a conference. I don't know, but I would mm -hmm. ask them rather than imposing a, a self-solution. Have you in your travels seen things that that you thought, oh, this could really help? This is how we, you said, don't address yes. the little stuff. Like what could we, you know, what, yeah. do, we, what do we address? So you know? I, what I really saw is, you know, Hillel has this wonderful learning fellowship where they're teaching students Jew Jewish wisdom. And it's a fellowship, it's like a serious program. And sometimes when I was speaking, I would cite a text or a piece of Jewish wisdom and I would see, certain kids in the audience go, oh, 
And like, they'd be like, we studied that. Like, we know that text. And, you know, supporting that kind of substantive Jewish identity. <laughs> I cannot stress enough because I think we make a mistake in the Jewish world when we say, okay, our whole purpose has got to be to fight anti-Semitism. That's what we do. We fight anti-Semitism. Well, there's a small problem. If you know nothing about Jewish history or Jewish tradition, you are useless in fighting anti-Semitism. Because if you know nothing about Jewish history or Israel's history and someone says Israel is a white apartheid colonial genocidal state, what are you going to say back to them? You don't know anything, right? You've never learned. Or if someone says, you know, Judaism is a legalistic, vengeful, you know, unspiritual religion, what are you going to say if you don't know anything about Jewish tradition, right? Like people can throw this anti-Semitism at you. And if you have no substance with which to respond either to them, them or to you, you'll believe them. Like, I, yeah. like learning and knowledge is critical to responding to anti-Semitism. And I would also just respectfully note that we have seen forms of anti-Semitism for thousands of years. There are also 16 million of us with an M. Okay, that is the size of one large city in the world. And I keep hearing in the Jewish community this idea that if we just had the right tweet, then we'd do it. We'd nail anti-Semitism. If we just had the right campaign. Guys, 16 million versus 8 billion. Okay, you know, to say that we're going to end anti-Semitism, it's like saying we're going to bail out this tsunami with buckets. We've got it. No, we're not. Right. Oh, I think there's know, a lot not... we can do. We, there's a lot we can do to fight anti-Semitism, but you also have to build an arc to survive the storm. Right. You can't just be constantly fighting the water. You have to build the arc, too. It's both things have to happen. And I sometimes worry that I see too much on fighting the tsunami and not enough building the arc. And they're both critical. So which is the what? which part is the arc? Are you talking about again about study or is there more to the arc? I think it's Jewish community. I think it's Jewish joy. I think it's Jewish ritual, spirituality, history, dance, whatever it is about Jewish tradition that feeds your soul, that connects you to others, that connects you to Jews across the globe and throughout history, that's the arc, right? It's strengthening ourselves as Jews, making ourselves more passionate, spiritual, committed, engaged, learned Jews. That is the arc. And look, then there's plenty of stuff we can do to try to fight anti-Semitism. But again, the idea that 16 million Jews are going to fight however many anti-Semites are out there, it's a tough one. And I, I sometimes see people saying, well, campus organizations should make Jewish students warriors for Israel. That's what they should do. Give them talking points, this and that. And and some of them are. You know, Hillel is training Jewish students to do TV, to write op-eds. But guess what? The vast majority of Jewish college students, they don't want to spend four years being warriors for Israel. They want to be college students and maybe experience some Jewish community and joy and if we insist that Jewish organizations force them to be warriors for Israel, they will walk out the doors of those organizations and they will not come back. So I think remembering that art creation, that joy, that pride, that community, that whatever it is that ignites you about Judaism, I think that's really, really important for these young people and for all of us. So Shabbos dinners and as yes. we just, what about... What, what about um, what about Jews? I mean, we can take a step back from campuses if you want, because a lot of what we're talking about um, with college campuses can sort of also maps onto the outside world. Right. What about people who do have a want to have a life outside the Jewish community? Um, I mean, I, I would highly recommend that. Still possible, you know. I, think, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I mean, this is a Jewish this is a Jewish magazine, and you know, we're talking yeah. Jewish stuff. But I, 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 you know, yeah, of course. I mean, I think that's critical right we 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 i mean we live in a you know we live in a non-jewish country right that's not it's sort of not really an option and you know i also have a lot of empathy for jews for whom that's increasingly challenging because of where they work or because of the community in which they live right i think i think there are plenty of jews who work and live in places that are okay that you know maybe aren't perfect but more or less okay but i think the the jews i'm seeing who are struggling are those in certain progressive organizations where mm -hmm. they're just feeling more and more oppressed, right? Where, again, I think there's a little bit of confusion about like, oh, but they just have a different argument about Israel. I can tell you what an argument about Israel is. Right? I can tell you how to criticize Israel. I have many criticisms of Israel, but, you know, calling Israel depraved genocidal monsters and colonialists and white murderers and these things, like, those aren't criticisms of the Israeli policy. Those are just insults. Those are, those are just insults. So I think that's where I think some Jews are really starting to struggle. So yeah, of course, of course we can have these things. And look, there are people who disagree with us and we can have good arguments with people who disagree and want to actually talk about policy as opposed to just hurling insults, which I don't think is a 
an interesting argument to have. So it sounds like in some ways the, 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 your, the vision would be like, there are parts of the world you can engage with. Don't bother to engage with the people who won't talk to you and won't engage and won't argue and won't this and won't that. That's, but there yeah. might still, there's still people out there that you can in there fact are. engage with. Oh yeah. my gosh, this is what I tell students on campus. Yeah, There's this one kid, I love this, who played me a recording of him trying to engage a classmate. And the guy is like, Israel's genocidal, you're murderers, you're this. And he was like, hey man, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with me. I'd love to talk further with you. And the guy's like, monster, murderer. And he's like, okay, um, I really appreciate that. I was like, okay, sweetheart. You know, like, I, I so like appreciated the spirit, right? Like, I, and like, good for him, right? But, yeah. you know, for every kid screaming like that, there's another kid who's like, wait, what's Hamas? Or like, sorry, what river and what sea? Right. That's a kid you can engage with. Or a kid who says, look, I have some real problems with it, X, Y, and Z. That's a kid you can engage with, right? There are people who either just don't know anything, or maybe you see a kid who posts something on social media and you say, wait a second, you know, here's how that hit me. Here's what these words mean. And they say, I had no idea, right? There's so many mm -hmm. people who you can talk with. Don't focus on the small number of extremists. And mm -hmm. they are a small number of hardcore ideologues. They're just very loud. They're not a majority, but there's a really quiet middle who's being influenced by those extremists. And that's, I think, what scares me most about college campuses. The number of people who are the hardcore just extremists is tiny. Let's mm -hmm. be clear, tiny numbers of people, but they're very loud. And they've now created an atmosphere where the kid who really could care less about any of this now kind of just thinks Israel's sinister. There's something bad about Israel. It's just bad. That's, and that's, the kid's going to grow up and work in a company or a school or a hospital and have that sense that there's something deeply sinister about Israel. That worries me. So do you feel like when you walked through these encampments, I know you said before that encampments weren't really worth the, the weren't, weren't, weren't the, worth the, the, the uh, emotion that's being expended on them. Yeah. I mean, did you feel as if um, most of the kids in the encampments were in this hardcore or were most of them just, you know, swept up in the excitement and it's fun to live in a tent, right? Yeah. I mean, I think there is, I, I mean, I can't, I like, I don't have data, right. I, I don't want to speculate because I don't actually know. And I, so I want to, I want to be careful, but I do think there are some of both, right? Mm -hmm. I think for some kids, this is just like, oh, it's yoga, it's community, it's acceptance. But um, I don't know. I just don't think we'd be so shrugging our shoulders about it if this were a camp that was a white nationalist camp, right? I don't think we would find that. We, I don't think we'd be like, oh, but some of them just don't know. Some of them just, I don't think that we would assume they were that stupid. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I guess I just think these kids are 18 or 19. Clearly they can Google. So you know, I kind of expect them to know something, you know, and I, I just, I would also just make, respectfully make the point that it, you know, and most other protests in history, whether it was women's suffrage or the civil rights movement or Vietnam or Iraq or Occupy Wall Street, if you went up to someone at one of these protests and said, why are you here? I kind of give you an earful, right? I'm here because the Iraq war is bad and it's la la la. They would tell you, it's a little chilling to see some of the you know, what some of the students have told me in some of the videos that you see where you go up to a kid in the encampment and they're like, you're making me unsafe. I can't speak to you. Talk to our media person. Like, that's a little strange. I understand they don't, you know, it's an age of social media. It's different from past protests. So I do want to acknowledge that it, it is different. But if you really think a genocide is happening and someone is coming up to you and you you could persuade them, especially if they're from the media, wouldn't you jump at the chance to say, oh, thank God you asked me. Yes, here's what's happening. This is a crisis. And well, not I don't if you know, think the evil street. Jews are in charge and will never hire you if you get <laughs> caught on cam camera. You know, it's all. That's, and, and that is, I mean, I, I, I told Jewish students, I always tell Jewish students, I was like, you know, when they ask me, what should we do? I always say, number one, you sign your name, you show your face. Do not ever sign a petition anonymously. Do not ever wear a mask when you protest. Unless you have COVID issues, that's fine. But like outside, you show your face. You show your face. You don't be a coward. And I, I am appalled. The, the masking here is reminiscent of a very ugly part of our history where people have hooded or masked themselves mm, in order to avoid the consequences of their behavior. And I find it sickening. Are you seeing I that on both it. sides? I mean, I know it's associated mostly with the, with the no. Palestinians. Yeah. I have not seen any Jewish students wearing masks. None. Not once. So it sounds like, so are you actually, you've, you've been able to have conversations with people who are on quote, the other side. It sounds like. No, no, no. I go and I talk to the Jewish students. I don't, I walk past encampments, but I don't, I don't go into them. I hear this is what the Jewish students are telling me and I trust them. And look, I think there are probably plenty of Jewish students on campus who just very understandably say, 
I don't want to touch this. I'm keeping my mm. head down. I'm keeping my mouth shut. I just, I don't want to touch this. And I think plenty of them are probably doing okay. You know, I think it's like in the eighties, if you were gay and you just kind of kept your mouth shut and didn't, you know, stayed in the closet, you're probably fine. Right. No one was going to, you know, you're probably fine. And I, it just breaks my heart to kind of even say that, you know? Mm -hmm. So just one more question about this and then we'll, let's, let's zoom back a little bit and then I'll go to questions um, of which there are some definitely. Um, you, you said something about, you know, the communities, you know, you don't want people shrugging it off and saying, oh, it's really nothing. Is that, is that your sense of what's happening? Do you feel like people aren't concerned enough about this? I think that there are a lot of people who are very concerned like that. I'm not worried about, you know, I think people who are engaged yeah, in the Jewish community are quite that's concerned. What I'm hearing, yeah. But I do, you know, it's funny, I do still encounter Jews who insist that actually the real, the only problem is on the right. That's the only problem. And let's be clear, there is one heck of a problem on the right. I, I mean, like anyone who says this is limited to one side or the other is dead wrong. You know, mm -hmm. the data just said it's dead wrong. It is on both sides. It's serious on both sides. And I, I do sometimes still see people say, well, fine, but you know, these college kids aren't going to shoot up my synagogue. I mean, okay, God, God willing, they will not, of course, but like, that's a pretty weird standard to have, you know, I, that, that disturbs me. So I do still hear, I think it's less and less frequent that you hear this now. I think it's, I think, especially after the encampments, I think it just, it's become, I still do hear it actually uh, among some folks that this is overblown, that it's not really anti-Semitism, that we're not really this and that. And I take their point that you need to be thoughtful about it, that it, you know, people who are like, this is the Holocaust. No, it's not. You know, let's be, right. let's it's like take slow. a yeah, breath. Right. Yeah. There's, there's right. a big difference between this and the Holocaust. But I also think to dismiss it is um, very unwise. Yeah, I'm fascinated by people you sometimes see saying, well, you know, my kids can't go to Ivy League schools, but they'll be safe at Liberty, you know, send them to the South because they'll be safe with the right, with the evangelical Christians. You know, that's fine. There's no problem over there. I mean, that is, again, it's just like that kind of extreme. It's either one or the other, it's black or white. No, actually, this is, and I will say, look, their campuses are diverse. There are some places where it's much better and some places where it's much worse. And I couldn't find any pattern. You know, sometimes people oh, said to me, well, it's, it's the elite schools that are bad. And I was like, I went to this very unelite school where it was bad. And I went to this elite school where it was great. So nope. And it's like, well, it's the big schools. It's the small schools. It's this school. I'm not convinced there's some pattern. Maybe someone has found it. Um, I'm not convinced. It's a, That's really interesting. That makes it sound like it really has a lot to do with individuals and how they act. And I think it does. I mean, look, I think if you're going to go on to conservative campuses, to more conservative Southern campuses, you're going to find less of this particular kind of anti-Semitism. You may find other kinds, right? So as you said, like, no, there's not, not many free lunches these days, I think I would say, but there are definitely places that are better and worse. And I'm not sure, you know, I don't think we're at the point yet where we say, let's give up. Let's just vacate these schools. I, I don't want to do that yet. I think mm -hmm. we need to give this some more time. I think schools are beginning to take measures. I think the pendulum's swinging back. I think they're beginning to realize this has gotten out of hand. So I think taking a breath, taking a beat, and just kind of letting this unfold a little before we make some big declaration of the community would be wise. Interesting. What do you think it'll be like in the fall? Because, you know, everyone knows oh. it's fun to protest in the spring. I have no idea. Um, I don't think this will go away, is my guess. Um, I don't know if it'll be as uh, frantic. I think it depends on what's happening in Israel. Right. You know, I wonder what happens after the election, depending on which way that goes. I have I I stopped predicting the future after the 2016 elections. So <laughs> I have no idea. Right, right. There's that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I don't want to end on that note, but we're not ending. No. But I do, no, no, I no. do want to go. I do want to go to questions. Um, right. And maybe we'll come back briefly at the end. So um sure. A lot of people are very engaged, want, mm. have a lot of things they want to ask you about. So thank you before Great. I let you go. Thank oh, you so thank much. Oh, thank you. This is delightful. It's wonderful a conversation. conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, I was actually, one of the first questions I was going to start with was this question of safe schools. Um, there's a lot of kids out there starting the school year, having to make those college decisions of where to apply. Um, and uh, there are people talking about schools to apply to and not to apply to. And just what are your thoughts of that and the impact that that might have on Jewish students who are at these supposed unsafe schools? Yeah, I mean, I that makes me nervous. I'll tell you, it makes me nervous because I think there's a lot of factors that can affect what a school is like. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes the, the worst leaders, the worst student leaders can graduate. Sometimes, you know, a different administrator comes in 
you know, to say like this school is just totally safe and good. Everyone go there or this school is terrible. These things can change. Actually, this is more dynamic than we think it is. Are there some schools that are just going to be awful? Yes. I think we can all name you know, four or five schools that they're just not going to be great. But I, I, I'd i be very careful about ascribing any great permanent significance or status to any school. I think that's a little dangerous. You know, I think it, it helps to look for, okay, where is there a strong Jewish community? You know, where are there Jewish adults and staff members who my kid can go to if they need help? You know, where I think things like that, as opposed to some arbitrary de decision about which schools are bad and which are good, I I'd be a little careful about that. Uh, what's your advice to students uh, about professors who yeah. are uh, teaching, they're teaching loudly, um, yeah. a lot of anti-Semitic hatred and anti-Israel rhetoric? You've got to report it. And I, you know, it's, you report it to Hillel. That's, I think, a good place to start because the Hillels, they know how to navigate the schools and the administrators and they can be an advocate for you. So I think it's so important to report these things. And I know it can feel scary, but I think it is, I think it's just better to have it known. And I think you can probably have some control over what happens once you report, but people need to know about this stuff because it, you're probably not the only student who's struggling with this professor. Um, that said, I also understand that some students just don't want to do this. They just want to keep their head down, keep their mouth shut and and kind of go through. And I don't I don't blame them. Right? I don't think we should be shaming students who just aren't, for whatever reason, prepared or up for taking that on. And it's also and if they if that's the decision to be that they want to make, I would just really advise them to get support for themselves. Right. Like talk to someone, get support, get someone who you can go to and say, God, the professor said this thing. It upset me just so that you're not I, I would just say don't be alone in it. But I really would urge students if they feel comfortable doing so, it's so important to report this stuff. You know, I kept meeting students who had just kind of given up. You know, it's like, how many things can I report? It's like, I get that, but you've got to know. You've got to know. Mm -hmm. uh, moving off campus, uh, someone uh, would like you to give your vision. You talked a little bit at the very beginning. Um, you had some ideas for Jewish education for adults and new ways yeah. to do it. What, what are yeah. your thoughts on that? So I, you know... I think so many Jewish adults like me don't have a basic Jewish education, right? And that's something to be, I think I had so much shame around that. I thought I was a bad Jew, right? The number of Jews who said, I'm a bad Jew. It's like, why? Why would you say that? And it turns out they're a bad Jew because they don't have a Jewish education. It's like, how is that your fault, <laughs> right? Let's, let's take away the moral judgment here. So I think, you know, the number one thing is to figure out a way to learn Judaism that works for you. I think for some people, for many people, that can just be an intro to Judaism class. And there are lots of intro to Judaism classes that exist. Synagogues offer them. They are the reform movement, various movements offer them. There's a wonderful one I've heard of at the Stryker Center that I think is even online. It's supposed to be fantastic. So like just taking a class and maybe it won't be the best class. Okay, fine, take another one, but that's just a ready-made way. And then you meet other Jews, you meet a rabbi or educator who can be a support. So I think like those things exist and taking advantage of those intro classes is huge. But I also understand some people, the class thing isn't for them or it doesn't work time-wise. And that's where I would say reading books, actually, you can get yourself a pretty good Jewish education with a library card. And, you know, in the back of my book is actually an appendix of resources guiding people through that path if that's what they prefer. And these books, a lot of them have audiobooks, so you can listen in your car. So I think that that's another way is to just say, okay, I can't do a class, but, you know, I'm going to read or listen in on my schedule when I have time. I think another way is experiential, but some people are experiential learners. They don't learn by reading or taking a class. And so it might be like, okay, I'm a young Jewish professional. I, I'm going to start learning through Shabbat. I'm going to plan a Shabbat dinner. I'm going to go to one table, great organization. And I'm going to, I'm going to do Shabbat. I'm going to feel Shabbat, or I'm going to go to a Jewish meditation retreat because I want to learn about Jewish spirituality and I want to feel it. But I want to actually feel it. I want to have those teachings. I want to experience that. So I think, you know, or maybe it's like a Jewish service group or a Jewish environmental club. I want to go and serve and learn a Jewish text as I serve because that will be experienced. So I think those are different paths that you could take for adult education. And I think a lot of these opportunities are out there. You just have to do some digging, right? You just have to do. And I do wish there were like one, like a concierge service where you could just call this hotline and tell them about yourself, your sensibility, what you're looking for. And they could like guide you to the right opportunity because there's lots of great stuff out there. It can just be hard to find sometimes. Rabbi Google. 
Rabbi Google, right? Rabbi Google. Rabbi Google, it, it, Amy has the Ask the Rabbi section in moments. Yes. I also say, and I will include a link to this in our follow-up email, Moment uh, did a whole symposium on five books to be an educated oh. Jew. And Great. we had lots of different people with lots of different ideas. And so I will include that, that as a reference. Love that. Love that. Yeah. Uh, that somebody, was great fun. Somebody uh, said that uh, their daughter of a Jewish father who grew up persecuted in Nazi Germany, mm. um, they weren't raised in the Jewish tradition to protect us. Um, yeah. And they want to know what in the tradition helps you feel that being Jewish doesn't always mean being persecuted by anti-Semitism. Oh, I think that's a great question. And, you know, I'm going to answer that honestly, which I think that history tells us that being Jewish generally does mean facing some amount of persecution. I think we've had a really delightful vacation from that history in America the past 70 years. Not all of us, not all of us. I think we need to be sensitive. There are some parts of the country where no one's gotten a vacation, but I do think that's always part of it. But I think the much more important part is the thriving Jewish communities that we built even in the midst of some of the worst of that, right? It's like you look back in some of the worst periods of oppression and discrimination and abuse in Jewish history, and you see people who have a thriving Jewish community where they are studying Jewish texts. And something that's very moving to me as I was reading about the shtetl, like these you know insular communities in Eastern Europe, everyone studied. The carriage driver studied and the scholar studied. And it didn't matter the, the goal was not to be the best guy. The goal was to study. And if you learned three Psalms and that was what you could do, everyone was psyched for you. Right? The, like, man. There was, the, men, the men studied. The men studied. I should say the men. What, I, I mean, I can sort of consider myself when I go back into history, I just put myself in that room because who's going to stop me, you know? But but I mean, today, everyone can study. And, and I don't just mean, however, whatever study it means to you, it maybe it means planning that dinner or going to that retreat or studying that text. Like, Everyone can do this. There is a way into this tradition for everyone. And you look back and people were, were doing it. They were engaging, even with all that oppression. So I just, I will never buy this idea that like, you know, that our Jewish identity should be remembering the Holocaust and fighting anti-Semitism. How utterly depressing and how utterly disrespectful to all these ancestors who fought so hard to keep handing down this tra tradition to us for thousands of years. Right. There is something in this for everything. So, yeah, the persecution is out there. Sometimes it's louder. Sometimes it's quieter. But what is always here is this tradition that you can spend a million lifetimes engaging with and still not even touch the end of it. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I studied with this very, you know, very traditional Orthodox rabbi and disagreeing on everything. We're arguing. And he told me the story. He said, Sarah, before I became religious, I was just totally disconnected. And I, I was always bored just bored a lot when I was younger. But then when I discovered Jewish tradition, he said I was never bored again because there was always something to learn, to do, to participate in. And I thought that is exactly my story. I used to also sometimes be bored, but once I discovered Jewish tradition, I was, I've actually never been bored again. I thought like, how funny that this guy who I've just been fighting with for the past half hour, we have the same story. And I think that's actually the, the story of, of every Jew. We can all take a piece of this. And so in this moment, uh, you know, with what's happening in Israel, what's happening on campus, what from the Jewish tradition gets you through? What's something that really resonates with you to bring you hope and connection to Judaism? Yeah, I mean, one small thing and, and one big thing, just, well, actually, they're both big things. I mean, you know, you don't meet many like Hittites or Ammonites or Jebusites wandering the streets of Chicago or New York or LA, but you meet Jews, right? We're still here. And that is quite extraordinary as such a testament to the fact that I think our people has had something to say for thousands of years and still has something to say. And the second thing is just the Jewish moral sensibility of, you know, this fine tuning, the way that we see people in the world, you know, we don't just say like, go, oh, I, I love you. You see this, like this very particularity of like, you know, people say, it's not just like treat workers. Well, it's if you walk into a store and you have no intention of buying anything, don't ask the shopkeeper for the price of an item because you're going to just waste their time. That's not fair. And you can say, well, that is so weedy. You really need a law about that particular little situation. But that's what Jewish ethical law is, right? It's like at the eye doctor where they're just clicking that little machine to make you see that person in front of you more and more clearly. Jewish tradition is saying, really see that person in front of you. Think about their dignity and their humanity and think about their time. And you put yourself in that person's shoes. You really see them. And that just gives me such hope. Because at a time where 
you know, a lot of campuses are dominated by this ugly oppressor, oppressed, everyone's in some ugly category and we like or hate them accordingly. Jewish law says, no, 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 no. Every single person is created in the divine image. Every single person is sacred and precious and worthy. And it is your mission to see them in all of their humanity and dignity and to treat them accordingly. And I, I think that is a wonderful sensibility. And I am very grateful to Jewish tradition for that gift. Thank you. And and as we wrap up, uh, two book questions. One, uh, somebody would like to know the name of the book that you both mentioned uh, that Fania uh, O. Salzberger wrote with her father. Uh, yes, almost all. It's called, I believe it's called Jews and Words. Am I right, Amy? Yeah, I think all one word, Jews and Words, like done as a, it might even be lowercase. Yes, by yeah. Thomas O's and Fania O. Salzberger. And uh, you, I book. believe you're working on a new book. What 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 I will am. have for you in the future? Yeah, I'm working on a book now about how uh, my discovery of how my Jewish identity for most of my life had been shaped by anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, and Christian hegemony, and how I my whole like I'm just a cultural Jew identity actually wasn't as I thought. I thought that was freely chosen. It wasn't. Um, it was an identity that was a result of a lot of very dark forces in history. And I think that had really colonized my Jewish identity and beginning to understand history and is like, was the key for me to begin stripping away those influences from my Jewish identity and, you know, be able to actually engage with Judaism on Jewish terms. So that is the that's the idea of the next book, writing it now, and hopefully it'll be out in about a year and a half or so ish. Great. Well, we'll love to have you back. <laughs> thank you so much. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Amy, so much for uh, speaking with us today. I thank the audience for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, I will send a follow-up email to everybody that will have a link to this program. So please share. And I'll also include uh, the link to Sarah's website and her book, her her here, all, yours is, which, what, I'm sorry. Here all along. That's here, the first here all along. <laughs> <laughs> getting getting everything cool. I barely remember the title so <laughs> it's a, it's a very long title it's a long way too long uh, and I'll also include the link to uh the article that I mentioned from moment magazine uh go to momentmag.com where you can register for next week's program a conversation with Craigslist founder Craig Newmark and we will see everybody next time thank you so much thank you so much thank you thank you very much nice talking to you Sarah nice talking to you too Amy thank you